Hi, Christina Johnson here. Welcome to the segment on narrative therapy. I know that I shared with you guys that I definitely align with the postmodern theories and already started talking a little bit about how we form our own realities through stories, through the stories that we tell ourselves and the stories that we tell other people. And so storytelling is definitely um, one of the ways that I believe that we make meaning. It's how we shape our experience, shape our behavior, and ultimately it's how we shape our lives. So in narrative therapy, I take the stance of curiosity and empathy and really just show a genuine interest in the story of my clients, that they come in the room with these problem-saturated stories, and I just show an, a genuine interest. There is a lot of healing and joining that happens in those first few sessions whenever they have someone that is just listening and able to bear witness to their story. Um, but much like was talked about before, I am not just merely listening and regurgitating what they're telling me. I listen with a certain ear towards um, what are some ways that I can help them maybe reauthor their lives. And so I, I want to search for times whenever they were strong, whenever they were resourceful. Um, and I ask questions in a way that is really not imposing, that's respectful. And in this approach with narrative therapy, I never label them. Um, and I just basically treat them as humans, connect first before anything else. And I know that we all have our unique personal histories and experiences that we've walked through. And so in that assessment phase in narrative, um, it really is about just remaining curious and asking about um, kind of mapping out how the problem has influenced the family, how it's influenced all of their lives. And I'm also searching out to what are some of the ways that they have influenced the problem. Some exception times or unique outcomes, sparkling moments as they're called in narrative therapy, where the problem had a chance to take over, but they didn't let it. So some of the goals in narrative therapy, um, it's definitely not to be a problem solver. Um, I'm looking for that second order change. I'm looking for a bigger, deeper change than just them coming in with this problem saturated story and okay, let's take each of these problems and then let's find a solution for it. Let's solve each of these problems on the list. As a narrative therapist, it's more about how can I separate them? How can I separate them from their problem saturated story and to open up some room, make some space um, for more constructive views of themselves. Instead of viewing themselves and viewing the family members as flawed and as, you know, damage these polarized negative views that they come in with, helping them to see themselves as heroes in their own lives and to see the family for the strengths and the assets that they have within them. So one of the things that I share with all of the families is that people are not problems. You know, I specialize in teenagers, so they have been told a ton of times that they're the problem. They come into therapy expecting to be hearing more of the same about how they're a problem. They're causing so much stress for their parents, all these phone calls from the school and and so they already come in with that expectation, if you will, that we're going to be talking more about how they're a problem for their family. A lot of times parents, too, have that fear that they're going to be told that they're the problem. 
that they are the reason why their teenager is struggling with depression or anxiety or getting into trouble at school. And so in order to quit the blame game and to be able to put the fingers down, um, because a lot of families, they come in with that blame game. They come in with pointing fingers at one another. The negativity and blame is super high most of the time. Um, nothing joins people together like having a common enemy. So why don't we separate the problem from the people and rally up the family together to tackle this common enemy, this invader that is trying to take over the family. So that is really the main goal that I have when I'm doing narrative therapy with the families that I get to work with. So there's some tools that narrative therapists like to use. Um, the unique outcomes or sparkling moments is a really great one that I start using from the get-go during assessment. Um, as they're sharing with me their problem-saturated story, I like to say that no matter how big a problem is, there's always these sparkling moments, these periods of time where the problem could have taken over, but you didn't let it. And I explore those exception times, those unique outcomes, whenever they stood up to the problem and they didn't let it take over. Deconstruction is another term that you'll hear in um, narrative therapy. And it's basically, as they're telling me about their the problems that they're experiencing, I deconstruct it by kind of just questioning the assumptions that they have about the problem. And this is also where externalizing the problems really can free up families. It frees them to challenge the influence that this problem is going to continue to have on their lives. So the very first thing is externalizing the problem. Then I go into mapping the influence of the problem on the family. Then I go into mapping the influence of the family on the problem. Again, those unique outcomes and times when they were able to stand up to the problems, oppression over them. And so those sparkling moments, I love to dig for the, for gemstones. And so those sparkling moments are pretty, pretty cool to find and to get to make bigger by magnifying them and focusing on them. So externalizing. One of the biggest tools, I would say that that is the hammer in the toolbox, the one that I have used most often. And so, um, like I said, I work with the families to reframe how they're viewing the problem from the get-go, let them know that the problem is not possessed by any one person in the family, that rather it is trying to possess them. It's trying to possess them as a family. And so it's about how can we rally together and how can we not let that happen? So some of the questions that I like to ask them, um, I'm gonna give you guys a little case example. So I have a family that is um, battling against an eating disorder and um, they have named the eating disorder Ed. It's kind of common to externalize eating disorders as Ed because ED, eating disorder. <laughs> and so as, as I'm externalizing that, um, it's really helpful to have them name it. And I'll go over an intervention with you all as well to kind of help you get in the practice of what it would be like to be in the room with a family and externalizing the problem, helping them to separate the problem from their own identity. So asking, how does Ed affect you? You know, during assessment, how does Ed affect you? And I ask each person in the family this, what other effects does it have? What does Ed tell you? When you guys sit down at the dinner table at night, what is Ed whispering in your ear? 
what is Ed shouting in your mind? And um, really help them to personify Ed as an actual person, as this unwelcome invader that is trying to invade the family. So narrative therapists call this, you know, relative influence questions. So I'm asking them these relative influence questions of how does it impact you, mom? How does it impact you, dad? How does it impact you, teen? And so that way everyone gets a chance to kind of express that, um, their own unique experiences with Ed. Um, it becomes really, really clear that Ed has had an impact on each and every one in the family. I'm helping them to see it in a systemic way, um, but I'm also helping them to see that, you know, Ed is really good at dividing and conquering. You know, Ed has gotten really good at disturbing the relationships that you guys have with each other. And, you know, divided we will fall, but together we will stand, we will win. Together, you guys can win against Ed. But so long as you guys are pointing the finger at each other and um, not on the same team, then, you know, Ed's sneaky and Ed's pretty powerful. So I need all of your guys' help to, to be able to combat this invader and to be able to win. So in reauthoring i know that i shared that it's about reauthoring making space for this new story um i use those exception times and i ask them what does this say about you you know for example if there was a time where ed could have taken over in that situation but they didn't let it what does that say about you what does that say about you as a person what does that say about you guys as a family that you guys were able to defeat Ed on that occasion. And so I also like to shift to the, to the future because in narrative, you know, every good story has a beginning, a middle and an end, right? It has a past, a present and a future. So once they have shared with me the past, their past with Ed, and they've talked to me about presently the impact that Ed is having on their family, then we were able to project into the future and what would they like to see as to how they as a family interact with Ed. So one of the, um, one of the interventions that I'm going to share with you guys has to do with anxiety. And so anxiety is a really common presenting problem that I see a lot of families for. So this is externalizing anxiety. So a solution to overcoming worry. So I explain to people that, you know, externalizing, I, I'm very transparent. So I let them know, okay, this is an activity. We're going to be externalizing the anxiety today. And so I explain that it's a process that's developed by narrative therapists. And the idea is that we often confuse people with problems. For example, we might say, I'm anxious, instead of, I'm feeling some anxiety. Changing the language can make a subtle yet very powerful difference. Can you tell the difference? Can you tell the difference in how you feel about yourself by saying, I'm anxious versus I'm feeling some anxiety? You are not anxiety. You're not anxiety. Anxiety is a feeling that can come and can go. And so we can take that step uh, a little bit further, take that process a step further by giving your anxiety a separate identity, its own personality, if you will. So imagine that the anxiety is an actual person. Is it male or female? How tall is it? What kind of voice does it have? How does it dress? How old is he or she? Whenever you have a full picture of anxiety, it might feel good to name it. 
This removes the anxiety even further from your true self. So once they come up with a name, sometimes they have a hard time coming up with a name. So I share with them, you know, one person that I know named her anxiety Eunice. She liked this name because it was a little bit silly. And this helped her to take anxiety a little less seriously. When she felt anxious, she could say to herself, Oh, that's just Eunice. She's a worrier. This freed her to do many things that would have been difficult for her to do in the past, from helping her kids to choose what college to go to, to advocating for herself at work. And sometimes when Eunice would get very loud and very big, she would imagine Eunice shrinking, shrinking, becoming tiny as a mouse. Other times when Eunice got scared, she would imagine soothing Eunice just as she would one of her own kids. And by disidentifying with her anxiety, she was much better able to take care of it and ultimately to take care of herself. So I hope that this example helped you all to kind of get uh, inspiration for how you can work with whatever problem um, that your clients are coming in the door with and just remaining curious, listening to their story, mapping out the story's influence on their lives, looking for those unique outcomes whenever they were able to stand up to the problem, not let it take over, and helping them to empower themselves as a family that they can combat this enemy that this invader is no longer going to win. One of the ways that, um, I think it was David Epstein, he really pioneered the letter writing. Um, and letter writing, you have it in black and white, you have it on this letter. And he would write these letters to his clients and, you know, really encapsulating appreciating and acknowledging all that they endured um, in their experiences with Ed, with Eunice, with whatever the named problem is, and then kind of summarizing their new story of how they were able to take their power back and able to stand up and not let the problem take over anymore and kind of predicting into the future, really sharing his hope and belief in them that they could continue those um, and maintain those positive changes that they have and continue that preferred story into the future. So I hope that this was helpful for you all and I'll see you in the next lecture. Bye.